uh, India's uh, geographic location, I think, as you rightly pointed out, uh, it is between the Middle East uh, and East Asia. And if you look up north, I mean, it's also linked to Central Asia uh, and the inner Asian uh, continent. So historically, I think India was at the crossroads uh, of the movement of people, uh, movement of uh, religions and ideas all across Asia, both on land and sea. And when the British uh, Empire was built in India, I think India became the center of the economic activity in the Indian Ocean and in the, in the Eurasian landmass. But after independence, I think India uh, went into an inward orientation uh, it shut itself down on economic terms, became more focused on, on internal growth. So that period we saw uh, disconnection of India from the rest of the world, but and in the name of non-alignment, in the name of self-reliance. But today, uh, in the last 20 years, as India has opened up its economy, India is now connected to the world, its economy is deeply connected to the world. So therefore now India is looking outwards again. And as it looks outwards, uh, its centrality of its location that you pointed out will come back into play. Therefore, I think India is in the coming years, as India's own economic weight improves, uh, it's going to have a big role to play, both uh, in promoting peace and prosperity uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Southeast Asia, in the Indian Ocean, and in Central Asia. So I think this is going to be uh, a period of where India will have larger and more expansive responsibilities. Look, in the case of China, I mean, we had bad relationship with China I mean, uh, for, for almost uh, two and a half decades uh, from the 60s when we had a war in the Himalayas. But in the last 25 years, I mean, there has been an attempt at normalizing relationship. Uh, things have improved. There's been no conflict on the border. Uh, but there are new problems that are beginning to emerge uh, in the India-China relationship. Uh, one, for example, the boundary dispute has become more active. The, all across the Himalayas, uh, the, the tension on the India-Tibet border has, has become uh, more difficult to manage. And right now there is no violence, but I think that's become an issue again. Then there is the whole issue of uh, the, the Tibetan spiritual leader Dalai Lama lives in India, so that creates some tensions between uh, India and, and China. Uh, then China's support to Pakistan, that creates problems for the Indian side. Uh, and on top of it, we, on the economic side, the good news has been there's been a significant expansion of economic cooperation between India and China, like everywhere else in the world, uh, that China is today, as the second largest economy, is an important uh, partner for India. But there again, there is a problem, the trade deficit uh, uh, in favor of China has dramatically expanded. So India wants China to address the question of trade deficit, put more investment so that we don't have the problem of the of the trade deficit, uh, but what we seen then, I think uh, things have improved overall. India, China today work together in BRICS and various other multilateral forums, but the boundary dispute remains unresolved, and and I think and that is in turn uh, connected to the Tibet problem. So therefore, uh, there are prob there is uh, a, a a situation today where, despite the progress, there is still. Uh, some concern in both the capitals about how do you create trust, how do you resolve the outstanding disputes. I think, uh, say, when the ideas of sustainable development first came, uh, for, in, for countries like India, which many of them believe that, look, uh, sustainability was a, a big country's, a developed country's agenda and not the agenda of the poor countries, so that whether it's climate change, whether it's environment, uh, it was argued 30 years ago that it was a problem of the of the of the advanced countries. But today, I think uh, the, even with the growth uh, that has taken place in India, I mean, there is clearly a massive problem uh, of uh, sustainability, whether it's uh, natural resources, or water, air, all the basic ingredients of uh, you know of life on planet uh, are under threat for different reasons. Therefore, I think in, in countries like India or China uh, don't have the luxury uh, of the kind that Japan or the, the advanced countries have had. First you develop and then you clean up. Uh, so I think today we can only, we have to grow by through sustainable means. Uh, given our size, uh, you know, India and China, you can't uh, today, if you do what the Western countries did 100 years ago, 200 years ago, I mean, then the whole 
uh, planet is going to in, in, in serious trouble and let alone uh, our own people. So there is today demand from the people uh, in India for example or in China saying that look there has to be sustainability. We can't uh, have a situation where uh, people are, are going to suffer because of the way development uh, takes place. I think the idea of connectivity has become the big issue. Uh, for example, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping has the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. Before that, uh, Hillary Clinton talked about a new Silk Road. The Japanese talk about a partnership for quality infrastructure. So, so whichever way you look at it, there is this uh, historic uh, push towards reconnecting these regions uh, with modern advanced infrastructure, which I think is a, is a good thing and I think uh, which is going to help integrate markets, which is going to help develop uh, uh, badly needed infrastructure in most countries of Asia. Of course, there are politics with it and I think uh, the problem comes when uh, some of this infrastructure development is seen as a strategic because in India, uh, some people suspect that the Chinese port construction in the Indian Ocean uh, is more about uh, geopolitics rather than about economics. Uh, so therefore, I think creating the trust with the Chinese becomes important. And meanwhile, also finding alternative ways in which uh, we do this in a manner that is beneficial to everyone. Uh, that's where I would think uh, Japanese proposals for uh, the, the quality infrastructure, I think provide a basis for thinking about connectivity in positive terms that benefits uh, everybody uh, in the region. Given the complex challenges that the world faces today, and I think we need more institutions uh, like the like the Sasakawa Foundation, which, as I said, non-partisan, uh, which can take up issues uh, and uh, uh, create genuine awareness uh, around them. The foundation also funds many research projects, uh, which brings people together. So we need more of that. And I think what we're seeing in Asia today, after nearly 25 years of uh, harmonious growth. Uh, today there is renewed nationalism, uh, there is a tension between China and India, we talked about this tension between China and Japan, China Korea, Vietnam and China, Philippines and China. So you, you see the resurgence of nationalisms which is threatening the peaceful rise of this Asia. Therefore I think we need uh, serious substantive support for work that limits some of this conflict, uh, which promotes greater understanding between peoples of Asia. Because all these years we're talking about rise of Asia and the problem was between the West and the East. But as we've discovered in the last five years, uh, within the East itself, there are deep divisions. So therefore, for any progress, uh, any peaceful uh, growth in this part of the world, uh, we need more work uh, of the kind that the, the Sasakawa Peace Foundation is doing. We hope that uh, there'll be more such organizations which can actually promote dialogue, uh, which can limit the dangerous consequence of nationalism and which can uh, show a way forward uh, in resolving existing conflicts. <music>